Welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. As you are aware, our course is entitled English Language and Literature and we have already been through a couple of lectures in module 1 and module 1 as you know is introductory in nature. These lectures are or have been designed for students in engineering colleges who have to learn English uh, at various levels where English is um, sometimes also a core subject. Okay? So, the course has been designed in such a way as to meet the both the language and literature needs okay, of students and it is also our hope that these lectures would appeal to students at higher levels. Well, as you know the last lecture was on the globalization of English and as I had mentioned in that lecture, of course, there, there are differences between phrases like the globalization of English and global English, but we are not, we did not go into those differences. We simply talked about what is entailed in the spread of English in different parts of the globe, both linguistically and politically. So, let us do a quick recap in fact of the last lecture. In the last lecture, we saw that studying the globalization of English um, has a huge scope really and the scope includes the study of the power of English, the history of English language and literature, the cultural aspects of the spread and establishment of English, the politics in English studies, the advantages and also the risks of risks of having one language right as a global language and also the diversity that is spawned when one language it becomes almost a global language. We also took uh, the help of a text by David Crystal on uh, you know the you know the globalization of English and talking about the global imperative we saw that Crystal says that there has never been a time when so many people wish to travel to so many places. There has never been such a strain place on conventional resources of translating and interpreting. And then finally, as you saw in the last lecture, he went on to say in fact that there has been a more urgent need for a global language. Then we also saw the importance of the 90s, um, again a point a very valid very important point that was given to us by David Crystal, where he talks about the importance of the, 90, importance of the 1990s in the sense that there were new linguistic varieties, particularly in the inter, on the internet. Also the recognition that many more and more languages were becoming endangered. There was also awareness of the global position of English and its public recognition as well as the identification of new social linguistic uh, frameworks. Okay? Then we also saw that there are some requirements for a language to be recognized as a language that is that has established itself on a global scale and among these are for instance the language has to have an official status for instance, instance it has to be used in government, in law, in media and education and also there has to be evidence of foreign language teaching in those countries. Then we also saw the importance uh, the global reach of English as far as press, the press, advertising, broadcasting, the motion pictures, transport and communication and sound recording are concerned and this is a point that we had taken up in the last lecture. We also saw, we also went through a couple of quotations uh, mostly by David Crystal and Crystal talking, uh, we, we saw Crystal talking about language and power when he says that why a language becomes a global language has little to do with the number of people who speak it. This is important. You may say that well, there is there are perhaps more people who are speaking languages other than English all over the world. There are more people speaking Mandarin Chinese perhaps than the English language. But Crystal says that uh, numbers do not matter here. What matters uh, as far as the power of a language is concerned, what matters is something else. And there he says that it is you know it has much more to do with as it says in the slide to do with who those speakers are. Okay? 
who, what is the reach of those speakers? Are, are those speakers, uh, though less in number, more powerful? There is the closest, he says, links between language dominance and economic, technological and cultural power. And in that sense, Crystal argues that English has considerable power. Then we also saw that there are several risks involved again in the spread of English as a global language, in the sense that they, it, would, it may give rise okay, and it has given rise to an elitism, to an elite class as, as we see here, okay, a class, a new class that speaks uh, English and therefore uh, English well and is resourceful, okay, has uh, better networks and more contacts and more power. So, there is also a cognitive edge for native users of the language um, relative to people who use the language as a second language. Okay? There are, there is also obviously the uh, danger of language death and language extinction and as well as a triumphalist note that many would harbor okay, as uh, you know adept speakers, uh, adept speakers and users of the English language. And reduced opportunities for many others. So, we saw that these are the global, uh, the story of the global reach of English or the globalization of English is not a triumph, just a simple triumphalist story. Okay? It is a story or it is a phenomenon, so to speak, okay, that uh, has many, many aspects, okay, both positive and negative. Fine. Today's lecture is entitled World Englishes. Okay, and it is related to other terms like global English, like international English, okay, as which you know are have been part of our course. So, we are now going to spend the next few minutes in this one hour lecture on what, what world English is and again we shall unpack the term world English like we had done in the case of uh, you know global English and see what it has to offer us. Well, as always, let me declare the texts to be used in this lecture, the texts and references from which I have gleaned most of the points for um, our lecture from which I, uh, books from which I shall also be quoting, right, some of the more important points and sentences. The first book is Andy Kirk Patrick's World Englishes, Implications for International Communication and English Language Teaching. Braj Kachru, as we know, is a very well known name as far as world English is concerned, as far as global English is concerned. We also had a lecture on the alchemy of English based mostly on or largely on Braj Kachru's work. So, the two books, uh, rather the two texts that we should be, shall be using are an, a, a book edited by Professor Kachru, which is the handbook of world Englishes, one of um, the better books or one of you know the most useful books that you, you could uh, you know you could peruse. Also Kachru's essay World Englishes Approaches, Issues and Resources, Kingsley Bolton and Braj Kachru's edited volume World Englishes published by Routledge and Jennifer Jenkins's World Englishes a resource book for students. Okay? So, these are some of the books those of you who want to explore this domain may look at such books. And we begin with one of the books that is you know that uh, um, feature here in this course and that book is by Kingsley Bolton and if you recall this is uh, an edited volume with Braj Kachru entitled World Englishes. And uh, Bolton let us begin by saying with Bolton that there are several interpretations as far as world Englishes, the term world Englishes is concerned. So, obviously, you know there is no a world English, okay, even though English has or rather because English has had a global reach, okay, there are world Englishes that is there are many Englishes in the world and that is why this um, uh, you know term entitled Englishes. So, Bolton says that there is no one definition of world Englishes and world Englishes may be interpreted or may be explained, may be described and discussed okay, from several viewpoints. So, let us see through Kingsley uh, uh, Bolton what those are. So, a, he says the expression, let us look at this slide please, the expression world Englishes is capable of a range of meanings and interpretations. 
In the first sense, he says, perhaps the table, uh, the term functions as an umbrella label. Look at this. Okay, this is important. The the first way of interpreting or understanding world Englishes is that it is a you know a framework term. Okay, it is a huge term and you know really an encompassing term, which he calls an umbrella term. And let's look at this here as an umbrella term, referring to what? Referring to a wide range of differing approaches. Okay, so world Englishes is a almost a paradigm term, okay, or an umbrella term, which refers to different approaches in the description and analysis of Englishes worldwide. Okay, so it 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 has oh, uh, you know it. Uh, it, it accepts the fact that no one, uh, one approach to the study, description, analysis okay, of Englishes all over the world would suffice and it refers therefore to a wide range of approaches. Then he says, well, in a second, let us look at this, in a second narrower sense, the term is used to specifically refer to the new Englishes. He says, well, there are others who uh, do not take such a you know a very wide almost panoramic so to speak view of um, world Englishes and uh, they say that well world Englishes should refer to the new Englishes okay found particularly let us look at this slide in the Caribbean and in West African and East African societies and to such Asian Englishes also as Hong Kong English, Indian English, Malaysian English, etc. So, many of you at least are familiar with the term Indian English. Okay? It is said that we have made and there will be a, uh, another lecture or a lecture devoted entirely, entirely to Indian English language and Indian English writing. Uh, at this juncture, we may say that, uh, that we are all aware of the fact that English, the English that we use and speak today, in fact, even the English that is being uh, written by um, by authors, okay, by creative writers who write in English in India, differs in many ways from what is we know know or what we call the Queen's English. Okay, English spoken in, in for instance the English that I'm speaking now, uh, you know, neither in uh, in in pronunciation nor in perhaps some syntactical uh, you know aspects uh, these do not uh, my this english does not uh, you know um, or or is uh, uh, or is not uh, the same as uh, the english that is spoken in great britain for instance right so um, the second way of understanding the term analyzing and describing writing about in academic um, journals about the term new uh, uh, world english is sorry is uh, new Englishes of these countries. Yet, there is yet a third way okay, and let us read from Bolton. In a third sense, world Englishes refers to the wide ranging approach to the study of the English language worldwide. Okay. So, there are as I said uh, many different scholars seek to focus on different approaches to the study of world Englishes. This first point that we have raised through Bolton. Okay, should make us aware of the fact and therefore, that the scope of studying world Englishes may, may or should also be very wide. Okay. So, what is the scope of studying world Englishes? Um, we study world Englishes from the point of view of the history of the English language, not simply as you are or as it is obvious the study of the, the English language in um, Great Britain or in the United Kingdom, but also its trajectory as it traveled to you know uh, different countries, whether through colonization, uh, direct colonization or trade and commerce etcetera. So, the study of the history of world Englishes is a very important part of the scope of English of world Englishes. And therefore, if you talk about English spreading to other countries, we have to talk about the diasporas people who have settled in other countries uh, or sorry in um, uh, in English speaking countries okay? and what is the history, the nature, what uh, you know uh, the kind, the varieties of English spoken in these diasporic or by these diasporic communities. Then obviously, that would lead to the question, let us look at this slide here please, lead to the question of the variations after history, diaspora, the, the, the next point is obviously the variations. Uh, of English that have uh, taken place or that have come up because 
of its long and complex history okay, and its use by diasporic communities. Then in what ways have these Englishes in different parts, in different diasporas, in different parts of the world, in what ways have they acculturated themselves? Okay, you know acculturation is a, is a word, is a term in the study of culture and particularly in anthropology. Okay, so, how has, uh, you know, how have these different varieties right, of English accultured themselves uh, to or with, you know, these different geographical areas in which it found itself. Then what next point is, is very important really, what is, uh, what happens in, when one is being creative with a language that uh, is uh, not one's own or in the sense that what happens rather, let us put it the other way, what happens to the English language okay, in its peregrinations so to speak okay, through different parts of the world where uh, it becomes an important language. right? And last but not the least, the question of ideology. Okay? Uh, let me tell you a bit about what ideology is. Ideology is a very important word in cultural studies, in uh, political science, in sociology, in fact in, the, uh, in, in philosophy, in the entire humanities and social sciences. What is ideology? Ideology may be defined as a world view or rather uh, you know uh, it is like a set of lenses that you, that you have through which you view the world. right? So, those uh, you know those uh, main propositions so to speak by which you describe what the world is and your own place in it is also going to determine your values, your beliefs and the ensuing actions. Right? So, ideology what you know how does English change one's ideology, what are the political implications of the spread of English and the building up uh, or the emergence uh, of world Englishes. Okay? Do, does it, um, does it um, uh, bring about a change in our ideology or and also when it is acculturated does it also undergo. Okay? Um, do native users of English also undergo uh, ideological changes as their language okay, gets changed uh, in many different ways over different parts of the world. So, you see obviously in uh, today's lecture we can we are not going to go through all of these is not possible for us. In fact, you could have an entire course developed only around uh, you know a world Englishes. However, we will see what important points and I hope I can bring home to you some important points regarding world Englishes. Then further again if you need, if you wish to go a bit further or if you need, wish to uh, go a, a bit uh, deeper really there are several other points. Let us look at this slide here please. There are issues of pedagogy. Okay? What is pedagogy? You know that pedagogy means the science and art of teaching. Okay. So, there are many pedagogical issues, how does one teach, how does one teach in a, a language which is not, which one knows is neither one's own language or nor the uh, native language of or the first language of one's students. Okay. So, there are huge pedagogical issues, what kind of strategies one uses, syllabus also is one of the most important points, what goes in, in uh, the syllabus in teaching English and what is left out. The next is the sociolinguistic context of world Englishes. Okay? Then uh, applied language studies, globalization is a point we saw in the last lecture, we talked about in the last lecture. Policies, okay? language, uh, policies of language use and language spread and policies regarding official language, national language okay? and finally, critical linguistics, okay? the study of language using critical perspectives. right? So, these are again as I said some more areas or few more areas if one use uh, one is willing to go um, as I said deeper into the study of world Englishes. Okay? So, what is the scope as you saw quickly running through it, the scope of English or world Englishes entails the history of world Englishes, the spread of world Englishes and the growth, emergence and growth of world Englishes, the study of diasporas in relation to world Englishes, variations, acculturation, creativity, ideology, pedagogy, sociolinguistic context, applied language, 
um, studies, globalization, language policy and critical linguistics. Now, uh, I would like to refer because Kachuri is really one of um, the most, um, you can safely say one of the most important professors, one of the most important scholars as far as the study of uh, world Englishes is concerned and I did refer to his um, uh, essay entitled World Englishes Approaches Issues and Resources. Okay? Uh, let us see how uh, Professor Kachru has, has uh, um, you know, uh, spelled out the scope of studying uh, world Englishes and the first point he mentions is the spread and stratification of English. Okay, what is stratification? Stratification is uh, obviously comes from the root word strata or stratum, okay, different strata. We, we study in sociology or in anthropology how society has different strata, okay, uh, how populations are stratified. So, also using it in the similar sense here, the spread and the different strata of the English language or rather here the, the use of the English language. Then second point, let us look at this slide here please, the characteristics of those stratification. Remember we are talking about varieties, okay? we are talking about Englishes okay, all over the world. Different kinds of English that have emerged on, owing to acculturation, owing to hybridization. Right? Then what are the, he says, what are the international contexts? Right? What are the interactional contexts of English on the one hand and native languages on the other hand of different, the, the different cultural contexts okay, uh, of interaction among languages. Then number four is, he says we need to look at the implications, what are the implications, okay, what are the things that come up um, in the spread of Englishes. Now these implications are not just linguistic implications as you know obviously by now. These implications are political implications also that as we said ideological implications, okay. Implications to do with power, uh, implication to do in the case you know with things like applied linguistics, right. So this is also another important way in which we can study world Englishes. And finally he says the descriptive and prescriptive concerns of uh, world Englishes. Okay? So, uh, as we saw Kachru also gave, you know, um, adds to the scope, many of these points ob obviously may overlap, okay? but I am just looking at a scholar who, you know, who, who, um, who has given us uh, you know, ways in which we can study uh, world Englishes and in fact uh, going by the title of his essay, Approaches, Issues and Resources of World Englishes, we can find that there are indeed further ways in which we can study English. Stratification for instance was not a point that was mentioned by me in the last uh, two slides when we talked about the, 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 the enormous scope of World Englishes. There are also other again other issues that come up, other approaches through which you we can study World Englishes and really you know if you are interested in in uh, doing work for the work in these areas, you can also find out there's so many, you know, so many uh, areas that are we are talking about, so many issues, so many approaches that we are discussing right at this moment. And some of you may even want to go on to do research in these areas. And among them are bilingual. It's very important, really, bilingual creativity and the literary canon. Take the the issue of English. Uh, you know, or take the example of the uh, of Engl uh, English in India, for instance. Okay, the English that is being spoken and written in India today, okay, is uh, particularly by writers who are writing, uh, for instance, fiction. Okay, fiction Indian writers or writers in India who are writing fiction in English. Their language, uh, their tropes. The figures of speech that are you know that are being used today are not the not or rather they have changed a lot from um, those who were writing uh, novels in English in a, if I may use the word in an older generation for instance. Okay, so um, Mulk Raj Anand is very different from Arundhati Roy, and those of you who have read novels by you know, um, uh, say Arundhati Roy is the god of small things, uh, they, uh, you will see how different, how there is there's so, so much of, you know, um, there is so much experimentation with the English language. Okay? So, if you are bilingual, then does your native 
uh, does your native language um, determine your creativity in the English language? I mean, there are many uh, important issues here. And uh, also, I should add, you know, in mean the translations, translation also is an important point here, as in this first point, which is bilingual creativity and the literary canon. Then also, we must according uh, uh, you know to scholars we must also look let's look at the slide here please we must also recognize the fact that there is no a canon today we cannot talk about a canon okay uh, why because the minute we say a canon there are a lot of implications here there are a lot of there is there are there are a lot of issues of exclusion of inclusion okay who gets included in the canon in the great 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 grand canon who is left out. Okay. So, today we have multiple canons, which is really I think a very good thing, right. So, because of world Englishes also apart from uh, the native languages that we use, um, there also is nativization okay, and Englishization, these are the two words, let us look at these again, nativization of the English language and the Englishization of native languages. Okay. Then there are the fallacies that come up because of this these interactions okay, which have been pointed out by Braj Kachru and of course, the power and politics of English which is a point really which that is going to run through all of the lectures really I feel and teaching world Englishes. Okay. How does one teach? Does one, which English does one, even, does one eventually teach, what kind of fallacies, what kind of errors are going uh, to be errors and what which are and which uh, you know usages are not really errors. So, this really is a dynamic process, okay. what is an error today is not an uh, uh, not in there are many words we use in Indian English which um, uh, would, be would be considered uh, erroneous. For instance, a word like prepon, apparently there is no word like prepon. So, we have a word called postpone. So, when you say you prepon a visit or you prepon a lecture, apparently this is a term we have added in English, okay, the preponing because of you know we have considered postpone the post as a prefix. So, we have changed the post to a pre. Okay. So, it is not really considered erroneous, you find so many people using, so many persons using it. So, what is uh, again, it's a, as we saw a question of pedagogy, what is considered correct and what is not considered correct also changes from time to time. So, uh, scholars like Kachru point to three diasporas really, remember we talked about diaspora being uh, an important scope okay, of studying um, uh, world Englishes and he's, uh, they say that the first diaspora comprises Wales, Ireland and Scotland and the main issues to be studied here in the first diaspora, diaspora of world Englishes um, are really two, the, the political rearrangements okay, and the cultural assimilation with regard to the spread of uh, English and the and the you know the, the, the emergence and the growth and development of different kind of Englishes. Okay. So, the Wales I, uh, Welsh, I, uh, the Irish and Scottish English shes are different from the so called standard English. Then the second diaspora uh, really coming after the you know uh, the establishment of the new world, the establishment of uh, Australia and New Zealand. So, uh, the uh, second diaspora is really the spread of English speakers to different to these countries and continents and North America, Australia and New Zealand, De these are the, these form the second diaspora. So, remember the first diaspora was really at home, right, Welsh, uh, English of the Welsh, Scottish and Irish varieties or rather in Wales, Scotland and Ireland that would be more proper and the second diaspora was after the movement of English speakers to North America. Uh, to Australia and to New Zealand. The third diaspora okay, is important, okay. uh, it is the spread again of English right, through trade and commerce right, to places, uh, to many places in South and uh, East Asia, to South and West Africa, South America, the Caribbean and Europe. So, this, these form the third diaspora, those of you who are um, you know um, 
well acquainted with history it won't be difficult for you to understand how this has happened so we have again we have um, the uh, emergence of and growth okay of different varieties of english of world englishes okay in these uh, areas then there is really a fourth diaspora now which is not to do so much with you know uh, with migration with the develop with conquest with political rearrangements etc it's really what's happening today okay the fourth diaspora is not we cannot really talk about it country wise okay it is uh, to do with a plural setup right let's look at the slide here the fourth diaspora is say is mono from monocentrism really to a pluricentric use of english okay where there are as he as uh, scholars have pointed out very correctly many autonomous englishes right so englishes that are not uh, you know both linguistically and uh, ideologically okay dependent on any other kinds of english right and this obviously has been enabled by none other than globalization and the rapid growth and development of information technology right so really this is um if this is uh, not really in geographical space like as we saw in the first the second and the third diasporas we're not talking really about the spread and the growth of world englishes on actual you know in geographical sense we are here now also talking about cyberspace space which is not geographical space but uh, on cyberspace so you see the uh, world english is the whole trajectory of world uh, the growth of world english is uh, culminates in the internet culminates in globalization and culminates in the information technology and its facilities right so this is as far as the spread in different stages of world english is uh, was concerned now uh, we also have uh, you know an, an association an international association uh, which studies you know uh, um, a body that studies conducts research conferences on world englishes and it is called the iawe or the international association for world englishes so now you know that world englishes is uh, really a, a, an area of study with its own in, on its own right okay and the the international association for world englishes also has journals for instance uh, there are these three important journals that i could name here world englishes english worldwide and english today so again uh, you know those of you who are interested may will uh, or may like to look at uh, you know uh, articles in these uh, you know these three journals so again let's go back to kirkpatrick who's uh, you know we we know that his um, we, are, we are referring uh, rather his one of his books is uh, part of our uh, text and reference right and then he uh, goes on to talk about the causes of linguistic variation we have agreed that there is variation we have agreed that there are world englishes and that is why we have a term a new term called englishes okay so he says let's look at the causes of these variations through andy kirkpatrick's uh, work so he says that linguistic variation uh, happens because of contact with other languages contact with other languages may lead to syntactic simplification and regularization there is also the influence of local cultures and ways of speaking okay once a language arrives in a particular place uh, there is there are issues of identity formation and membership and communication across cultures these are really the uh, these are really the to say the umbrella areas under which one could study linguistic variation including world englishes as we saw what are these this contact with other languages and the influence of local cultures and ways of speaking okay on the language that has arrived on okay then on identification uh, sorry there are issues of identity formation and membership and communication across cultures now let me refer to what edwin uh, thumbo has to has to say about literature and world english okay all this while really we're talking about language uh, thumbo on literature and world uh, english has the these very important points okay, he has made these very important points for instance if we look at countries like uh, india like sri lanka and malaysia countries that have a long and elaborate written and oral 
traditions, with you know, countries that ha whose history of writing and whose history of literary and creative works go back several hundreds of years. What happens to world uh, in, to that, the variety of English in these countries? Okay, now there are also powerful and sophisticated you know oral traditions, countries. Um, where you know orality has been part of parcel of both you know of both lit of, of literature of creativity and also of everyday uh, everyday ways of life really okay so on the one hand we saw countries like india for instance which had a long tradition of writing we also have countries uh, with a long oral tradition countries like nigeria like ghana and uh, Kenya and Papua New, uh, New Guinea. Also, colonial needs that is uh, South China, Singapore and the West Indies that is this is another way according to Thumbo, okay? uh, another uh, way in which uh, English has come to these countries and has uh, made an impact on also on their literatures. Right? So, all these countries no matter what kind of literary tradition whether oral or written they may have had no, uh, no matter what kind of reasons for instance colonial needs. Okay? Uh, the, all these literatures all their the literatures that have been uh, you know part of their tradition right, uh, are uh, the writing in these countries is also impacted by world Englishes or the varieties of English therein. Also English has been impacted by these long traditions. So, when we study these literatures, what are the let us ask, ask what are the ways in which we may approach say you wish to do uh, you are in curious about or is actually you actually want to do formal research okay, on you know the, the, um, uh, the interaction, the negotiation the, uh, between uh, English and you know the long tradition. Okay in a country. So, what are the different ways in which we can look and study and analyze okay, these aspects of negotiation and interaction and these are according to Thumbo unity, the unity and commonality, okay. then the, also the resistance right, the, uh, the, this is uh, uh, resisting depersonalization. How do the literatures or how have the literatures in these countries right resisted uh, the depersonalizing right of their uh, native literatures by the english language okay then third the reworkings how have it could be you know how have traditional works been reworked because of the impact of english because of the growth of a variety of english or even you know many Englishes within it could be as in India for, for instance many Englishes also in one country right. Uh, how have these literary how has, has the literary canon for instance being reworked what are the new kind of texts that are coming up because of uh, the growth of varieties of English okay. and has tradition being have traditional has traditional uh, or are traditional works being restored okay. Uh, paradoxically because of the development of varieties of English and of course last but not the least a very important question of modernity. Okay. How has um, the growth of varieties of English, uh, how has the growth of world Englishes okay, impacted uh, or even brought about okay, or say even changed modernity in different parts of the world. Okay. So, is modernity right, is modernity in or can we look at modernity in any part of the world in any region okay, uh, in relation to the development of world Englishes okay, or because of the coming in of world Englishes. So, these are some of the areas being pointed out by scholars that we may look into. Uh, uh, you know or that has you know things that have happened because of the coming in of world Englishes. I um, would like to look uh, or to bring to you um, a short extract right from a poem by the Indian uh, 
poet Kamla Das, uh, whose real name was Mad uh, Madhavi Kutti. And Kamla Das wrote, these, are, these lines have become almost emblematic of the uh, you know, scenario of um, Indian English right? or world English is in India. Right? So, I, if you look at these sentences, you can understand the predicament of one who is writing in another language. So, let me read from her poem. I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. The language I speak becomes mine, its distortions, its queernesses, all mine, mine alone. It is half English, half India, funny perhaps, but it is honest. It is as human as I am human, don't you see? It voices my joys, my longings, my hopes. I have uh, personally, personally been Every time I have read these lines, really I, um, I found them so beautiful and as she, the words she uses here, yeah, I have found these lines so honest. Okay? This is really emblematic of what happens when there is the growth of Indian English, or growth of a variety of English. Okay? Let me read it again. I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. The language I speak becomes mine its distortions, its queernesses, all mine, mine alone. It is half English, half India, funny perhaps, but it is honest. It is as human as I am human, don't you see? It voices my joys, my longings, my hopes. Uh, well, again coming back, we will end this lecture by again talking about Braj Kachru and his two models of English. Kachru says that, uh, Generally speaking, then there are two models of English that is something we all know which is native English and institutionalized non-native. Okay? The native and or other two, two uh, models that we can see in different, uh, different places where English has become a language of enormous importance, um, even though it is not a nat language native to that particular country or region. And these are again as we saw native. Uh, and institutionalized non-native. Then also he talks about you know in, as far as in the world English is concerned, he talks about issues of linguistic distinctiveness and national identity. These are things that we have already been through. I am just simply bringing to you how Kachru has made these different paradigms. Okay? For instance, contact literatures are to do with national identity and linguistic distinctiveness. These are the two areas that can be studied. And also, we talked about, uh, you know, when you talked about his essay on world uh, Englishes and the issues, approaches, etc., we saw, we saw that the first point he, he mentions bilingual creativity, right. And when he, he talks, now we are really unpacking that point, he talks about bi uh, bi sorry, bilingual creativity and competence, okay, one's competence is when one is creative bilingually. So, he says, uh, this competence is characterized by A, the ease of mixing okay, and switching. For instance, you know that uh, code switching is one of one is a major area in the study of uh, you know uh, when languages mix, right, when cultures mix. So there is, he says that the competence includes an ease with uh, you know code switching and ease with mixing of uh, uh, not only of words, a mixing of uh, you know uh, the mixing of uh, uh, phrases, the mixing of tropes, the mixing of figures of speech, right. Then next is one can also have a variety, if not variety, a considerable amount of stylistic and uh, discursive or discursive strategies when one is bilingually creative and one also has a rich verbal repertoire, okay, rich repertoire of words. Uh, the words in, in one's mental lexicon are not simply words from one language, one, uh, uh, words from uh, two or sometimes more than two languages. And blending into a new linguistic configuration, this also needs, leads obviously to new linguistic configurations, new parameters, okay? new, way, new uh, ways of using languages and uh, the culture specific meaning system. Uh, the 
availability of another language which is not one's um, native language and in which one also is competent okay uh, you know it, it has an impact or is again in turn impacted by the meaning system which is specific to cultures okay then such bilingual creativity okay in situations of world Englishes uh, leads to multiple norms as far as style of writing is concerned okay it may break with traditional forms of writing definitely it does break with tra traditional forms of writing with established ways of writing okay here are two semantic systems clashing not clashing really one here are two semantic systems um, I should not have used the word clashing two semantic systems coming together and there is this a lot of negotiation and interaction going on between these two okay then the situation there is an altered context for acculturation there are multiple codes uh, there are also formal experimentations or experiments in form and there are new resulted norms these norms or new parameters as we say new even regulations sometimes that are cultural aesthetic and semiotic in character let therefore let's read what Kachuri has to say about the bilinguals creativity he says and I'm quoting from him the universalization of English may be a blessing in that it provides a tool for cross-cultural communication but it is a double-edged double-edged tool and makes several types of demands a new theoretical perspective is essential for describing the functions of English across cultures in other words as he says the use of English is to be seen as an integral part of the socio-cultural reality of those societies which have been using it which have begun using it during the colonial period and more important have retained it and increased its use in various functions in the post colonial era fine so with this we come to the end of uh, uh, our, our discussion on world Englishes and I this is really as I know just touching the surface uh, of what world Englishes is and since it is you know meant for um, for uh, for students that um, are beginning to learn and talk about the English language and talk about uh, English literature in uh, you know in elementary ways it suffices for us to simply unpack and set a scope um, talking about bilingual bilingualism talking about the coming together of different languages talking about competence in two languages talking about the different diasporas okay as far as world English is, uh, is concerned right so let's move on to the questions and the first question we uh, uh, that we may have is a question like what are the various ways in which the term world Englishes may be interpreted and you remember that we began this essay no, sorry I'm so very sorry remember that we began this lecture by uh, invoking Bolton's words and uh, Bolton says that it is an um, a it is an umbrella term world Englishes is an umbrella term which refers to differing you know approaches to the description and analysis of Englishes in the world right so it, it is a term that talks that you know is used to 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 talk about the fact that uh, a to talk about the fact that there are so many uh, Englishes in this world and that there are different ways of studying them and different ways of analyzing and describing them in a second sense it says in a slightly narrower sense this is we talk about the new Englishes uh, found and this is uh, specific to geographical areas found in the Caribbean and in West African and East African societies the new Englishes in uh, Asian uh, societies such as Asian Englishes Hong Kong English Indian English Malaysian English etc and in a third sense world Englishes Bolton says refers to the wide ranging approach to the study of the English language generally to the study of the English language uh, as a worldwide phenomenon okay so these are the different interpretations of world Englishes next question if you get a question like delineate the scope of world Englishes that is what is entailed in the study of world Englishes we saw that the scope of world Englishes is indeed very huge it it begins with the study or you may say it should begin with the study of the history of uh, you know the history of um, uh, the spread of 
you know, or the develop emergence and development of different varieties of Englishes, then the diasporas, the variations of such Englishes, acculturation with native cultures, the what is entailed in creativity, and we saw quite of this in our lecture really, what is in uh, entailed in bilingual creativity. Uh, because with world Englishes, we know that when, whenever we use the term world Englishes, we know that there is a native situation where there is a different language other than English. And as we saw finally, most importantly perhaps, the political ideological implications of and issues you know in this in, in uh, this phenomenon called world Englishes. We also saw that if you need to go further into this area, then there are issues of pedagogy of styles and ways and the science of teaching of syllabus, how do we, uh, what, do, what is included in syllabi uh, and what is, uh, what, what are being excluded in syllabi in, in places or in regions, countries where well there is a variety of English. Uh, then sociolinguistic context, applied language studies, globalization, language policy and critical linguistics. Okay. So, this is the scope of studying world Englishes. Then how has world Englishes made an impact on literature? Then we saw that through Edwin Thumbo that uh, you know it has made an impact on uh, you know which is a two way and the impact is two ways really the change uh, uh, changes in, um, in both canon and styles and strategies and forms and themes in the native languages and in uh, the English language itself the world English variety in that you know that grows also because there is a uh, you know, because there uh, there is experimentation being done in the English language in and there are different situations. For instance, we can say that there are these long and Ill, countries with long and elaborate traditions of writing okay, of the written word for instance in India, in Sri Lanka, in Malaysia and on the other also we saw, as you see here there are also you know countries where there are varieties of English, but these countries have had very powerful you know and very sophisticated oral traditions which no less than written traditions. Okay, these are long and sophisticated traditions like in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya and Papua New Guinea and there are countries uh, which have served colonial needs apart from uh, you know uh, India and other countries so in Singapore, South uh, China and the West Indies. Okay, so, all their literatures have both impacted the English language and have been impacted by the English language. So, we therefore, some of the, the things that we, as we said we, uh, uh, the scope of or some of the ways in which we may look at uh, literatures and wor in world languages are the unity and commonality of how they are resisting depersonalization because of the coming in of or the growth of a variety of English. The reworkings that have been done on traditional literatures and the restoring also of traditional literary texts through both translations and through you know uh, through rewriting them uh, in the English language in the variety of English that is there in that country and most importantly the question of modernity how has it impacted how has the growth of world Englishes impacted modernity in various countries right. So, we come to the end of uh, today's lecture and well of course, this is just unpacking. So, I you know we had a feel of what world English is, is we had a feel of what its scope entails. Okay, we also knew that or we also knew today in, through our lecture that the literatures in native countries are affected by and are affecting you know the variety of English that is there in their country. So, this also forms part really of international English of global English, okay, but we have divided these into different lectures and uh, really thank you for being uh, with me in this lecture and I shall see you next time.